Perfect. So today we start the discussion with uh, probability. Uh, probability is a very important subject uh, in if you are, want to make a career in cybersecurity because a lot of the signals that you deal with in the context of attack detection or mitigation actually uh, are random processes and uh, probability and random processes, they are all sort of in the same field. So I want to start with uh, two things. Can someone tell me what the difference between risk and uncertainty is? Like just from your own experience, what is risk and what is uncertainty? What do you think? Anyone? What is risk and what is uncertainty? You have a thought on what is risk? Okay. But uncertainty is more about the disturbance or is unknown, like you cannot expect what it will happen. Okay, perfect. I think you are quite close. So she said risk is something where you can expect something. Uncertainty <coughs> is something where you don't really have any expectation. So the way I want to put it in mathematical term, Risk is uh, the set of events for which you have some statistics, you have some prior data available, and you can predict, or you have, a, uh, you can predict what the frequency of its occurrence is. So for instance, uh, if you think about your grocery bill every week, let's say in every week you're incurring some grocery bill, which I'm sure all of you are incurring. Uh, if you look at how much grocery bill is week over week, you will be able to expect that, okay, maybe I'm spending $200 in a week. No, $200 seems like a large number, but maybe like $100 a week in grocery expenses, right? So there's some expectation. Of course, every week it's not going to be 100, but it'll be maybe 90, it may be 110, but it's going to be centered around 100. Uh, uncertainty, on the other hand, is basically unknowns. whose frequency is not known. So risk is unknown whose frequency is known. Frequency is known. By frequency is known, what I mean is that you have some data from the past and based on that data, you can predict what might happen in the future. You don't, your prediction doesn't have to be accurate, but you can also give like a bound, like it will be between this number and that number. So that is risk. Uncertainty on the other hand. So let me uh, ask you about a specific thing for which you probably wouldn't have data. So. Can someone tell me when is the next tornado going to hit the Ohio State University campus? Can it happen? It can happen, right? It can happen in this particular region. But we cannot really know when is that event going to happen, okay? Let, let me ask another question. When is the next flood going to come in Columbus? And then the question is, can it happen? Of course it can happen. It probably happened millions of years ago. It might happen sometime in the future. And I don't know whether that sometime is tomorrow, day after, <coughs> one year from now, 500 years from now, millions of years from now. Uh, when is the next earthquake going to happen? So now earthquake is an interesting thing because Ohio has had, I don't know, 600 plus earthquake in the last 200 years. 
So about three earthquake every year, give or take. Right? So you still have some data about earthquakes, but those earthquakes are very minor earthquakes. If you look at the Richter scale, it will be like a Richter scale 2 or 3, which most of the people may not feel it uh, while they are driving the vehicle or while they are just doing engrossed in some work. So there are uncertainties where I know the frequency, so those are risk. There are uncertainty where I don't know what the frequency is, and those are unknowns. Right? Those are called uncertainty. So, <clears throat> so that's why uh, what we are going to talk about are risks in this particular class. So I'm assuming that whatever unknowns you have, what the temperature of uh, uh, Columbus is tomorrow, like what the weather is like in Columbus tomorrow, it is an unknown. I don't know what the weather is going to be like, but I can at least give you some high confidence bound that, okay, it's going to be warm in the morning, or during the day, it's going to be cold during the night, right? So I can give you, based on today's data, I can give you some prediction about tomorrow. Uh, but, but we are not going to talk about uncertainty, even though it's an important topic. Unfortunately, we can't really uh, uh, come up with a mathematical structure to talk about uncertainty. Of course, there are some mathematical structure around uncertainty as well, but those are too complicated and I would even say that they are useless from a cybersecurity perspective. Another uncertainty, by the way, is when is Ohio State University going to see the next cyber attack? Right? I don't know when that's going to happen. But what I do know is if OSU has an energy system, a building energy management system, if they have an IT system, there is a, there is a frequency with which the data is coming, there is a frequency with which the data is going out, and if we see an anomaly in that frequency, then it means that there is some attack happening on the system, right? So, so we don't know when the next attack would happen, but we know if the attack happens, what exactly is going to change, and based on that change, we will be able to detect that there is an attack happening on the system. So in this class, we are only going to talk about risks. We are not going to talk about uncertainty. So probability and statistics, it's the study of risks. It's the study of unknowns where you know what the frequency of occurrence is going to be. So in order to put a mathematical structure around this topic, I'll have to define a few things. <clears throat> so I have omega. It's basically a set of all unknowns. And then you have A, which is a subset of omega. It is called an event. And I have a P, which, max pow which maps power set to a value between 0 and 1. It's called the probability measure on omega. So this is a notation 2 raised to omega. It's the notation of power set. Everyone knows what power set is? No. Power set is a set of all subsets of omega. Okay. So let's go back to my favorite example, which is the temperature of this room. That's been a running example throughout this class. So what is omega? So we don't know what the temperature of this room is, but we've been in this room like, I don't know, I've been 10 times, but I'm sure you have been 100 times in this room, maybe for some other class. So you have some idea about what the temperature inside this room is. 
So what's the omega? What's the set of all unknowns? What's the set of all temperatures that you might have experienced in this room? What is the set? <coughs> yeah. Maybe we saw temperatures between 65 to 80. 65 to 80, wow, you are very bold. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good, uh, 65 to 80, okay, that's omega, that's the temperature of this room. Now let's change the uh, thing, uh, let's change the location. What's the temperature of Columbus, what's omega? The set of all unknowns, which is the temperature of the city of Columbus. Who wants to take a shot at this? Sorry? No. <laughs> Not 40. Uh, you mean Fahrenheit? Yeah. No. 40 you will leach like in two weeks. We will be like at 40. Yeah. Negative 12. Negative 12. Yeah. I mean, well, there have been situations where it probably reached negative 30 also. You know, blizzard and polar vortex and all that stuff that continues to happen. What's the upper limit of all unknowns? Okay. Yeah, 110 sounds reasonable. Uh, I want to be on the safer side, I'll make it 120, whatever, okay? This is the temperature of Columbus. Uh, what's omega of number of accidents in Columbus? Number of uh, traffic accidents, like car accident, truck accident, whatever that number may be. Uh, let's say in a year, okay? So we are looking at the entire year. What do you think? 500, 500 sounds reasonable. Maybe I'll put it at 10,000. I don't know, like I, I just don't know. So I'm just going to put 10,000 here, right? So this is number of accidents in Columbus. Uh, omega of all the earthquakes in Ohio, okay? So this is easy because it can only be between 0 to 10, right? So there is no earthquake, then it's 0 on Richter scale. And if there is a violent earthquake, it's going to be 10. But of course, the number, I mean, the number here is actually between 0 to 2, somewhere around 2.5 or something. So this is the... Richter scale of earthquakes in Ohio. So as you can see, depending on what the unknown is, we can come up with a set omega that is, uh, in this case, the set of all unknowns. If you're tossing a coin, what is omega? If you're tossing a coin, what's the set of all unknowns? Uh, it's just head and tails. Okay, so omega could, could also, like I've written all the numerical values here, but you can also have omega, which is just a generic set. Head and tails, it could be cats and dogs, it could be uh, whatever. Uh, one interesting thing that I look at uh, is uh, whenever I get like student's email, I look at what's the dot number. So dot number tells me what's the distribution of the last name of students and faculty who come to Ohio State is, right? So my dot number is 706. So there have been 706 or probably now 800 Guptas in Ohio State University. Um, so that gives you some idea about what Omega could be. It could be last name of all the people who have entered Ohio State, right? So that could also be uh, Omega. So Omega is, the set of all unknowns. A subset of omega is an event. So, so let's look at an event. I'm going to take a subset. 70, 73. 
Okay, that's an event. Closed interval 72, 73. Here I'm going to take A as 60 to 70. This is roughly the kind of temperature we are seeing in today's, like in the weather today, somewhere between 60s and 80s actually. So these are all events. I can, I can also define A to be 75 and 77. I can define A to be 75, 85. Same thing and so on. I can define, so here my A could be head. It's just a subset of omega. <coughs> so I can pick any subset of omega and that's known as an event. And what the probability does, this mapping P, what it does is it maps the subset to a number between 0 and 1. That's called the probability measure. So for this room, I'm going to claim that PA is probably 0 0.9. So the temperature of this room, 90% of the time is between 70 and 73. Okay, that, this is the one that's counting the frequency of this event occurring. So how many times the temperature is between 70 to 73? I think this room is very well air conditioned. So I'm assuming that the probability of A is going to be 0 0.9. What about uh, this, what was this number? This is the uh, temperature in Columbus. So what's the probability of this A? Uh, I don't quite know what this number should be, uh, but I know that there is six months of summer and six months of winter. So I think this should be somewhere around 0 0.05 or something. So about 5% of the time, over an entire year, the city of Columbus experiences a temperature between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And if I have an unbiased coin, what's the probability that A would appear? Actually half. Yes, just the probability that head would appear. So I toss a coin, how many times head is going to appear? That's one half, okay? So the probability is basically measuring the frequency of an event to occur, okay? So event is a subset, omega is the set of all unknowns. Uh, this is a subset and probability maps a subset to a real number between zero and one. So what are the uh, different conditions that the probability measure should, should satisfy? So let's, uh, let's study that. As you can see in all these examples, I'm very easily able to construct omega and I'm able to construct events. And I'm able to also define the probability measure on omega. But there are other examples like when is the next uh, tornado going to hit the university? I know the set of unknown is it'll hit the university or it'll not hit the university. Uh, I, I can also construct an event but I can't really construct the probability measure. So that's why it's an uncertainty. <clears throat> so these are the three conditions the probability must satisfy. P of A must be greater than or equal to zero. P of omega must be equal to one. And the third is, if AI intersection AJ is a null set for all IJ, then probability of union of AI, I equals one to infinity, is equal to summation. So this is the null set. So for all ij, ai and aj do not intersect at all. There is no common element between the two sets. Then if I take the union of all ai, uh, of all ij, 
i not equal to j then then this condition needs to be satisfied Yes. Is O omega in the real number? No, it can, like I said, head and tails is also a possible omega. So omega can be anything, any uh, abstract uh, set. Uh, like I said, you know, it could be the set of all last names of people who have come to Ohio State. That's not a real number, it's just a bunch of string. But uh, you can have omega that is constructed out of string. In large language models, omega is literally the set of all uh, substrings that we see in English language or whatever language they are building. So, um, yeah, so, so omega could be very abstract quantity. <clears throat> the only thing that converts that abstract quantity to a real number is this probability measure, okay? So it needs to satisfy three axioms. First is probability of an event always has to be non-negative. The probability of the set of all unknowns, omega, has to be equal to one, right? So you cannot have things happening outside of omega. And if you pick a sequence of disjoint sets, so these are disjoint sets, because AI intersection AJ is a null set. Uh, if you take a sequence of disjoint sets and you want to compute what the probability of the union of disjoint set is, it must be the probability of, the sum of probability of individual events. Okay, so these are the three axioms that the probability must satisfy. And the entire theory of probability, random processes, stochastic processes, all the stuff that you've seen in math department and statistics actually uh, builds upon these three axioms <coughs> of probability. Okay. Any questions so far before we move on to the next topic, which is random variables? No? So remember, omega is a set, is an abstract set. Uh, we can't really work on, we, we can't really compute things based on an abstract set. So we need to map it to a real number. So mapping omega to a real number is known as a random variable. So x that maps omega to r, it's called a random variable. And x that maps omega to Rn is called a random vector. So the temperature of this room, it maps omega which is the temperature of the room to a real number, which is also temperature of the room. So it's just an identity map. That's a random variable. But you could also ha have a situation where I say that, okay, I'm going to toss a coin. If it becomes head, then I'm going to pay you $100. And if it becomes tails, then you have to pay me $100. So then I map the head and tails into plus 100 and minus 100. That makes it a random variable, okay? Because now I have a real number that I'm trying to uh, map it to, map the omega to a real number. <clears throat> if I look at the dot number, right, so our last name dot number, so omega is our last name and whatever dot number, whatever the maximum dot number we have is the real number, right, so dot 706. So, uh, so that's also a random variable. Now, random vector is, uh, is, is also something similar. 
So if I'm looking at the temperature of all the rooms inside this building, that's a random vector. That's probably a 100-dimensional random vector. And do you know how many rooms are there in university? Any idea? So incidentally, there are like 400 buildings in the university. And let's assume that each building has 100 rooms, give or take. So we probably have 40,000 rooms in the university. Each of those 40,000 rooms has a temperature sensor because they all have thermostats. Some rooms have two or three th temperature sensors. But let's assume that it, there is one temperature sensor per room. And every minute, each of these sensors have a reading, temperature sensor reading, and it goes to a company called Corporate Analytics. They are our service provider for uh, storing all the temperature data and uh, a lot of other sensor data as well. So all those 40,000 readings is getting stored in corporate analytics. So if you look at the entire university, this N is actually 40,000. So it maps the set of all possible temperatures of all possible rooms in the university to the same thing, the temperature of those rooms. So that's a very high dimensional random vector, you know, 400, uh, 40,000 dimensional random vector. Okay, <clears throat> so once we define a random variable, so we'll, we'll get to the random vector in a bit because random vectors have a bit, uh, uh, some, some cool uh, things happens with a random vector, so we'll get to it in a bit. Uh, today we'll talk about random variables, okay? So we are only mapping omega to a real number, we're not mapping it to a vector. So with random variables, we can actually define uh, what is known as an expectation and a covariance. This is denoted by E of x, which is integral over all omega of x omega p d omega. And this p d omega is basically probability of omega, omega plus d omega. So I'm looking at this interval, omega to omega plus d omega. And uh, that's giving me, that, that's the notation. Like we write it in short form, we write it as P D omega. In the long form, this is basically probability of omega to omega plus D omega. <clears throat> if omega is discrete, then you can write the expectation of X as summation omega x omega, p omega. So let's look at an example. Any question? How many of you have seen expectations before? One person, two, three people, few people. Have you seen expectation before? You have? Okay. Awesome. So let's look at a simple example. Omega equals to head and tails. And my x of omega, 100 if omega equals to h minus 100 if omega equals to tails and my p of omega 1 half omega equals to h 1 half omega equals to tail. So very simple example. So my expected value of x is 100 times 1 over 2 minus 100 times 1 over 2 equals to 0. So expectation is the same as average. 
what is the average marks in the class? It just means that you are taking the expectation of the marks, which is a random variable. Any questions so far? So expectation is the same as average. Now, along with expectation, uh, they, there is also something called a covariance. Oh, sorry, not co well, covariance is something we'll study later. But we'll study uh, variance right now. So let me write down the expression for the variance. And then we'll compute the variance there. So variance is defined as x of omega minus expected value of x, then we take the square of this quantity and then we integrate it with respect to the probability distribution or probability measure. Okay. Any questions on covariance? Uh, sorry, uh, on variance. So one thing that you will notice in variance. Remember, this quant this quantity could be positive or negative, as we can see there, right? So the expectation can be positive or negative, depending on you know what is more probable values of x. If you look at the variance, on the other hand, this term is actually square of a real number. So this term is always non-negative. And this term is always non-negative as well. You know, that's how we define. That's the second axiom. No, the first axiom of probability is P of d omega always has to be non-negative. So all events have to have non-negative probability. So this is non-negative, this is non-negative. So the variance is always non-negative. Okay, it's always greater than or equal to zero. Let's go back to this example here and try to compute the variance. So I have 100 minus 0 square times 1 half minus plus minus 100 minus 0 square times 1 half. Turns out that the covariance here is 10,000. Okay, so even though the expectation is zero, the covariance could be, the variance could be a very high number, very large number. What does a high variance mean? What happens when variance is small? What happens if variance is equal to zero? What does that mean? When can variance be equal to zero? Any thoughts? When is the, this quantity, this integration is going to be zero? If x of omega, is equal to expected value of x. So no matter what value of omega we pick, the expected value of x is the same, right? Then the variance is equal to zero. 
right? So if you get salary, for instance, no matter how much effort you put in on the job, you get the same salary every month. So the variance in salary is literally zero, <laughs> right? So omega is the amount of effort you put in from day one to day 30. You can put in very high effort, you can put in low effort. This is what you're going to get at the end of the month, right? The variance is zero. Okay, when is variance very high? So in this case, you see that the variance is actually very high. When is variance very high? If x of omega only takes extreme values, like it takes values that are at the boundary and uh, expected value of x is somewhere at the origin, then in that case, the variance is supposed to be very high. So actually in this case, the variance is very high. Let's look at a slight variation of this example. I'm going to pick, uh, I'm going to make some changes to this. I'm going to make it 900 and I'm going to make it 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. Okay, let's do the computation all over again. Nine hundred into zero point one minus one hundred into zero point nine, and that is equal to zero. So the expected value is still zero in this case. The mean is zero. Let's look at the variance. 900 minus zero square plus minus 100 minus zero square What kind of number do I get? It's 810 plus 1000, 1810. I hope I have not made any mistake. No, I have made a mistake. This should be 0 0.9. So I have 9000 here. So I have 9810. So the variance here is smaller than the variance we had previously. Okay. So it's clear how do we compute the expected value and the variance of a random variable. Now, uh, I'm measuring the temperature of this room and let's say somebody attacks this room, or somebody launches a cyber attack on this room. Uh, it's an autonomous system, right? So somebody launches an autonomous, uh, sorry, somebody launches a, a cyber attack on this room and they are basically trying to change the, the sensor reading of the temperature sensor of this room. Now remember, temperature of this room is a random variable, right? We measure this temperature every one minute. Uh, what do you think will happen when there is a cyber attack on the room? Cyber attack on the temperature sensor of this room. What can go wrong? What can go wrong? Technically, three things can happen. What are those three things? So the first thing is my omega itself could change. You know, earlier I was measuring temperature between 70 to 73 and suddenly I'm measuring temperature between 1000 degrees Fahrenheit or 5000 degree Fahrenheit. So my omega has completely changed because of the attack. What else can change? Well, the expected value of the temperature can change, right? Because right now I'm getting the temperature reading all the way, like earlier the expected value was 70 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit. 
now I see expected value of 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 1000 degree Fahrenheit. So my expected value can change or my variance can change, right? Uh, earlier my variance was only two or three degrees Fahrenheit throughout the day. Now I'm seeing the variance of 20 degrees, 30 degrees throughout the day. So that also indicates that, uh, that there is a cyber attack on the room, I mean on the temperature sensor. Sometimes the variance could reduce. So if it is giving a perfect 75 degrees Fahrenheit temperature all the time from morning till evening, then it means that the temperature sensor is being wrong because there are people coming into the room, there are people going out of the room. So the temperature has to fluctuate during the day. In fact, the, uh, the way Ohio State University people learn that a temperature sensor has failed is when the variance actually goes to zero, they know that the temperature sensor is not working anymore. So they send someone to fix the temperature sensor. So they look at the, vari they look at the temperature, and if the temperature is going up and down, they are happy. If the temperature is flat throughout the day, throughout the night, no matter what's happening, then they know that the temperature sensor has failed. And then they come and replace the temperature sensor. So reduction in variance could also be an indicator of something happening on the system. OK. And on the other hand, what, it will be what is the indication of high variance? A high variance? Yes. Uh, what do you mean? Like the number. The variance number. If it is so like variance very high means that x omega is, is oscillating between very high value and very low value. Like, so my subset is like huge. Your subset is huge and you could be swaying between one extreme to the other extreme Very from one time step to another, yeah. So that kind of thing happens in the case of forest fire detection. So let's say you have a sensor that is sending the temperature reading and if the wind is in the direction of forest fire to the sensor, then of course the sensor reading will be, I don't know, 500 degrees Celsius or whatever. And then the wind starts blowing in the cross direction and then the temperature sensor will give you ambient temperature, right? Which could be 25 degrees Celsius or whatever, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever the local temperature is. So that kind of situation also appears and that's an indicator of, okay, maybe something has gone wrong in that particular area. Okay, yeah. That's right. So how to separate, separate the fault and cyber security okay. uh, Very difficult to separate them out. The only way you can separate out, so her question is, uh, my variance can reduce because of cyber attack and my variance can reduce because of the faulty sensor. So how do we know whether it's faulty sensor or a cyber attack? And the answer is it's very difficult to know. So typically what happens in engineering systems is you have some experience with the system so you know what failures can happen. And then you, whenever you see that there is a problem, you try to see is this a failure that I've seen before, in which case it's a failure, or is this something that is something that I've never seen before. And then they, if you have not seen it before, then it's likely a cyber attack and then you do further investigation and further investigation to assess you know, how do you solve for that particular attack? It's very hard, it's a, real, it's a real problem, and it's not very clear how exactly this whole thing is going to evolve over. And we'll, we'll talk about a few case studies later on. So for instance, when GPS sensors are spoofed, it's very difficult to imagine if you're, uh, okay, so this is something that I can tell you from personal example. So in Chicago downtown, there are a bunch of you know, uh, highways, one over another, right? And uh, what happens is if you're using a GPS, uh, uh, if you're using your regular like phone GPS to navigate, when you are on the surface, everything is fine. As soon as you go underpass, it starts behaving abnormally. And the problem is that you don't know if you have to take a left turn or a right turn because the GPS sensor is not working. It's giving you some random, like it's, it's literally moving from one point to another in the space like within a matter of a few milliseconds, which is not possible because you're in a vehicle. So it's extremely difficult. So this is a practical advice. If you go to Chicago downtown, do not drive. <laughs> uh, because 
you don't know how the GPS is going to behave as you're moving through the roads within the downtown, some of which can take you underground. So that's a real challenge. Uh, and in those cases, so you could have that situation because of a cyber attack as well. So in, in that particular situation, actually the nature is attacking your GPS signal. It's actually preventing the GPS signal to reach to your GPS sensor. So those kind of situations can happen, and then you don't know whether it's because of nature or it's because of some GPS spoofer, which is in that particular area. Uh, this one incident, which you can actually, which you can actually find in your, uh, in some news article. So in Washington D.C. area, um, there is an airport, and the air traffic controllers, every 11 a.m., they were finding that there is some problem with the GPS sensor. So the GPS sensor is going haywire, you know, giving some random locations. And so they were trying to investigate what is happening. Like why is the GPS sensor suddenly failing at 11 a.m. and it's completely fine at 11.05 a.m. And they realized that there is a truck driver who passes from that vicinity who has a GPS spoofer on the truck. And the reason why that truck driver has a GPS spoofer on the truck is because the owner of the truck tracks the truck all the time. Like, where is that truck right now? So in, in order to fool the owner of the truck, that particular driver had a GPS spoofer on the truck, but that <laughs> signal was actually spoofing the air traffic control GPS signal. So you can have all these kind of situations and, uh, and you know, you have to figure out how to safeguard yourself from these situations. Of course, uh, there was no mishap on the airport because of that issue, but it's something that's actually widely reported in the news media, so I'll share the article uh, if I can find it. Any other question? Okay. So next, uh, what I want to talk about is some uh, examples of probability measures. So the first example is uh, Bernoulli, Bernoulli random variable. So here, omega is just 0, 1, x of omega is omega. What is the expected value of omega here? Expected value of x. It is p. What is the variance of x? One minus p. One minus p p plus p. Oh, one minus p square. P. It's one minus two p. So x omega minus expected value of x square oh, yeah. times p plus zero minus p square times one minus p. Now somebody help me with this question, it's too difficult for me. No, actually it's not that difficult. Let me think. Oh. 
ओके पी टाइम्स वन माइनस पी Okay, that's Bernoulli random variable. Uh, this kind of random variable appears when you have only two outcomes, head or tails, true or false, pass or did not pass. Um, and then the, there is a probability of p or one minus p, depending on you know, how you define the random variable. And uh, this is how you compute the mean and the covariance, the variance of the random variable. Okay, the second one is a binomial distribution. This is the uh, basically number of success in n trials. So if you have, if you do n times, if you toss a coin n times, how many times head appears? Or if you take a series of ex sequence of examinations, how many times you succeed in the examination? How many times you pass in that examination? Right, so if you're doing running every day, and let's say your goal is to hit five kilometers of running every day, right? Or 10,000 steps, like I try 10,000 steps, I'm never able to meet it, but anyway, that's my, definition of success. So how many times in a month, so I have 30 days in a month, how many days have I been successful in completing 10,000 steps in a day? Okay, so that's number of successes in n trials. So this omega is between zero to n, and the probability of x equals to k is given by n choose k, p raised to k, one minus p raised to n minus k, where p is the probability of success in one trial. So omega goes from zero to n. I can have zero success, so I can have a month when I've not gone more than 10,000 steps every day, okay? And I could have a month where I've done that all 30 days. So I can go all the way from zero days in a month to 30 days in a month when I'll have traveled 10,000 steps in a day. So what's the probability that, uh, that I will be successful k number of times in this one month period? It's given by this expression, so n choose k, this is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. p raised to k, one minus p raised to n minus k. And this is basically where p is the probability that I will uh, go more than 10,000 steps in one day, okay? So whatever is the probability in one day, and then you use that number here, and you get the binomial distribution. So I think all in all, uh, we have like some more distributions to go over in the next class. I'll talk about probability density function and probability mass function, and then we'll go over a bunch of more distributions in the next class. Uh, so I'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.